Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Linda McElduff. I'm from Ulster University, and um, specifically from the planning team within the School of the Built Environment. And thank you very much for the kind invitation to come along this afternoon and speak to you about um, my, my three-year doctoral research project, which had the explicit aim of examining regeneration policies and practices in small coastal resorts on the island of Ireland in order to critically understand their governance and robustness for enabling resilience. It's probably not the most catchy of, of aims, but nevertheless, the, the rationale behind the study was really related to research having been carried out in England over the past decade or so, which identified coastal towns as places suffering from social, economic and physical challenges and issues. And there has been much political and academic research carried out since then, seeking to raise awareness and enhance understandings of the different types of issues facing communities on the coast and what might be done to alleviate or remedy some of these. And what we have seen over recent years is initiatives like the Coastal Communities Fund, the establishment of coastal teams and coastal partnerships in the rest of the UK, where, where the coast has emerged as a distinct policy area in its own right and equal to that of the more traditional categories of urban and rural. Yet research has shown that coastal areas remain relatively poorly understood. And so what I set out to do as part of my PhD was to find out what was happening on the island of Ireland. Did our coastal places face similar issues to those in the rest of the UK? that were receiving relatively more attention at that time? And if so, what was being done about it? And at this point, I want to acknowledge also that the contribution of Professor Greg Lloyd and Dr. Heller Ritchie from Ulster University, and also Professor Deborah Peel, who contributed very much to this research. And what I want to share with you today is just some of the key findings from, that, from my PhD studies in relation to these five key areas. So firstly, outlining the, the coastal context and the Pacific challenges, opportunities uh, facing those people living on the coast, and what those mean then for their planning and regeneration. Second, on picking this term resilience, which has found its way into um, contemporary policy making agendas and how it might be useful or beneficial to viewing um, regeneration at the coast. I'll then present a model of my own making, which provides to, uh, a heuristic tool for exploring and enhancing these potential linkages and relationships between regeneration and resilience. And then using that model, I want to share some very brief findings from, from eight case study towns that I looked at across the island. Before then presenting some final thoughts or action points for how I believe the future resilience of our coastal towns can be achieved or enhanced. So we might all appreciate that our coast is a very valuable resource. It contains highly productive and diverse ecosystems, which in turn support a range of socioeconomic needs and desires, including recreation, tourism, power generation, industry, and so on. These are activities are situated in an area that is continuously subject to change. <clears throat> Coasts are increasingly acknowledged as vulnerable places, and are facing uncertain and unpredictable futures, particularly in the context of global climate change. In the UK and Ireland, coastal communities also face a range of socioeconomic challenges, such as changing demographics, seasonality of employment, and decline of traditional coastal industries. Recent studies, however, point towards a new era for coastal communities in terms of a growing events and leisure tourism sector, including golf tourism, and increasing appreciation of coastal heritage, as well as diversification into new alternative industries such as marine renewables. But there's evidence to show that many coastal communities have struggled to respond effectively to previous cycles of decline and lack sufficient resources and capacity to be able to capitalize on such opportunities. So some form of intervention or regeneration is often required. Importantly, coastal settlements have traditionally been on, on the margins of central government regeneration policy and have often been treated as indistinct from the wider environment. Consequently, regeneration policies and practices have traditionally proceeded in the same manner as urban areas with little recognition of the distinctive characteristics and problems facing coastal communities, which was identified as one of the key contributing factors to accentuating decline in English resorts. Importantly, Marine resources have risen up the policy agenda on the island in recent years, particularly in terms of marine planning and management, with increasing uh, political and policy interest in optimising the social and economic potential of coastal settlements. The Northern Ireland Marine Plan team are currently working on producing Northern Ireland's first marine plan, and Ireland are a little further behind in the process, but will also produce a plan uh, for their marine area. 
I'm not sure how familiar you are with marine spatial planning, um, but the marine plan will essentially inform and guide the regulation, management, use and protection of a marine, marine area. We argue that the marine should not be regarded as an isolated policy or planning regime. It is linked inextricably with the coast and then with the land. And marine planning is required to have positive terrestrial as well as marine impacts. And this offers a real opportunity for coastal communities to enhance the resilience of those communities by contributing to sustainable growth, by integrating with terrestrial land use planning and engaging the community in that process and also by bringing marine and coastal issues and resources to the forefront of debates. And this is important because coastal areas, coastal communities, tend to share a number of economic, social, environmental and governance values and characteristics which differentiate them from their inland counterparts. So for example, many coastal communities on the island have experienced relative economic decline over recent decades, stimulated by changes in traditional coastal industries. Yet many remain reliant on these industries, which can accentuate problems of low wage, seasonality of employment and the like. On a more positive note, as previously outlined, recent years have witnessed an increase in recognition of the economic potential of the island's marine resources um, in the context of blue growth. And there are opportunities there for coastal communities to tap into such developments if properly supported and managed. Coastal areas are experiencing increasing rates of coastal erosion, they are vulnerable to predicted rises in, in sea level. Um, and that is a potential deterrent to regeneration drivers and potential investors. The winter storms of 2013-2014 provided a stark warning, a reminder of the vulnerability of our coastal communities to changing environmental limits. And an appropriate planning response in terms of the location, siting, design, layout and infrastructure is needed. In terms of governance values, the statutory land use planning and regulation of the island's coastal area is both complex and challenging. It is often not fully integrated between land or sea or between the different sectors of activity. Responsibilities for coastal management are spread across a number of government departments, as Susie so eloquently outlined, reflecting a wider division in, uh, of planning functions. There is a confusing jigsaw of overlapping regulations, property rights, access rights, and sometimes outdated legislation. The coast is very much betwixt and between. It's an area of the convergence of a number of policy areas. And this complexity can be a deterrent as well in terms of investing in and regenerating intercoastal areas in the long term. So there are specific issues and challenges, but there are also specific opportunities facing our coastal communities which merit fuller, um, further attention. Differentiation not only exists between the coastal and inland uh, divide, there are considerable diversity between coastal settlements and coastal communities themselves. In an early piece of work, I analysed the all available social demographic data for all small towns on the island, so those with populations greater than 1,000 people but less than 10,000, and identified these six broad categories or trends that they tended to follow. And these range from those that were doing really very well and could be considered rather prosperous, to those who scored below average on all of the indicators and so were displaying signs of decline, signs of stress. And what I wanted to know was why were some places obviously able to, to deal with change and to take uh, opportunities as they, as they arise, whilst others are not. And more importantly, what was being done, if anything, to address the level of decline in these striving areas. And what this analysis said to me was, okay, our, our coastal communities may not be at the same level of decline or deprivation that many are in, say, England. They're smaller centres of population growth to begin with. But there are some that are really quite obviously um, struggling, um, but are perhaps not gaining the same level of recognition at the, at the level at which decisions are being made. So I suppose the clear message coming from this section of the presentation and the paper um, is that a one-size-fits-all approach to the regeneration of coastal areas is, is inappropriate. Approaches need to be tailored to the specific underlying conditions of an area. So how can we do that? We need to think more critically about the design and implementation of sustainable interventions. And it's been increasingly argued that regeneration, pro uh, regeneration approaches or sustainable development agendas need to take into deliberate consideration a place's resilience to future change whether that change is social, economic, environmental or physical in nature. 
Resilience has infiltrated contemporary policy-making arenas, including planning and regeneration. And I'm sure everyone here has come across the term resilience before being used in one context or another. Um, and of course, it acquires different mean meanings when used in, or applied in the context of a time-specific um, crisis. Unforeseen shocks, such as coastal flooding, um, are quite different from undesirable, slow, burning change like the decline of uh, coastal tourism or something like that, and will obviously require different responses. Resilience is a, is a widespread, fuzzy concept, um, and I think that is both the beauty and the difficulty with it. It is widely criticised, not least in relation to issues of clarity and the diffuse understandings within policy discourses and then its translation to practice. But nevertheless, building resilience has become a pr principal concern and a, a priority in many policy areas and seems set to stay. So we need to understand, we need to enhance our understandings of it and how we are using it. Now I don't want to go into any great detail on the evolution of the concept or, or its varying interpretations of which there are many. But I do think it's important to briefly outline the term and how I've used it, how I've interpreted it and what the benefits are then for looking at coastal regeneration. So resilience was first interpreted as the ability to simply bounce back. It was about stability, it was about efficiency, it was about maintaining a, a status quo, that steady equilibrium. And this perspective is often referred to as engineering resilience. The concept has since evolved to encapsulate more than a system's ability to bounce back or maintain that status quo, but its capacity to anticipate change, to adapt to change, and importantly, take advantage of any opportunities coming or arising from that change. And this perspective is often referred to as social ecological resilience. And it's beneficial, I think, in a number of ways, but I just want to point out two to you this afternoon. First, it observes that just as humans have a great impact on ecosystems at all scales, so too are humans profoundly influenced by their ecological context, people and nature as interdependent systems. For instance, the intensified human occupation and development of the coastal zone may greatly reduce the capacity of the coastal ecosystems to respond and adapt. The consequent environmental degradation increases the vulnerability of coastal communities as it threatens the availability of goods and services available. So social ecological relationships are inextricable. And because it acknowledges the relationship between people and nature, it may help produce a more holistic regeneration response or approach, incorporating the needs and aspirations of local communities and decision makers in conjunction with natural processes and ecosystem services. Secondly, resilience thinking argues that society should aim to strengthen its ability to deal with uncertainty and surprise, rather than attempt to control nature or counter any change. This highlights the need to embed foresight, robustness and adaptability into placemaking and planning activities to facilitate that creation of more strategic and place sensitive approach. The more recent emergence of community resilience encourages us to consider that adaptive and transformative capacity at the local level. And we can see that transformative capacity at the coast already, where some communities are diversifying into alternative marine industries. Yet, on the whole, regeneration policies and practices have largely struggled to reconcile the applicability of resil resilience with place-specific processes and challenges. And an important first step is to understand the different dimensions and components of resilience and how these might variously impact on one another, either positively or negatively. So various studies uh, from diverse areas of research have sought to identify certain components or strengths of um, community resilience. There is no accepted um, components or list of components, but these are eight that I've identified as, as being common to the literature. And the important thing here is the combination of these components. It's the interaction of these various dimensions, which variously shapes community resilience. So the prevalence of one will variously impact on others. For example, there's found to be greater levels of participation in and leadership of local initiatives where there's strong connection to place. So questions are raised then in relation to how components of community resilience might be recognised, might be fostered and might be mobilised to inform, shape and deliver regeneration or renewal efforts. And that of course will be different for different places. As a way of illustrating how resource use and resilience thinking may be embedded 
within the wider sustainable regeneration discourse, I developed a model called the Octagon's Value Model, which I'd like to share with you now. And there are various layers or levels or, or steps to build in this model, model that, uh, that I want to talk through. First, the model is framed by the four established value domains of sustainable regeneration, environment, economic, social and governance, the ones that we discussed earlier in the context of the Pacific coastal characteristics and challenges. These values overlap, highlighting the need to reconcile needs, priorities and values. And regeneration approaches will um, emphasise one domain over another, depending on the specific characteristics and challenges facing a particular community. So some places might place emphasis on the economic values, for example. Others may place emphasis on the environment. Second, the inner octagon represents the identified components of community resilience from my previous slide. These components are linked by the overlapping circles of the value domains, illustrating those interdependencies that I talked about and the values and components that need to be reconciled if communities are to enhance their overall resilience. The dashed lines uh, illustrate the permeability of the model and the potential for overlap, so demonstrating that mutual informing and co-influencing qualities of regeneration and resilience. The intersecting areas of the value domains illustrate four dominant aspects of sustainable renewal at the coast that I've identified from my research. In this context, regeneration refers to the process of managing and instigating change. Resilience outlines the ability of society and ecosystems to respond or adapt to change. Resources include social, economic and environmental capital. And reconciliation refers to the need to mediate competing interests and resources at the coastal interface. The arrows simply demonstrate that those are not fixed and they contribute equally to each of the value domains. And for the next part of my presentation, I want to briefly outline just some of the key concerns, key challenges coming from, from the case studies that I investigated as part of my research under these four key um, aspects. So firstly, as, as we might expect, regeneration is articulated differently around the coast, depending on locational and historical context, cultural and physical attributes, and the social economic characteristics of a given area, including the scope to diversify that local economy. Tourism remains a dominant component of many coastal regeneration efforts around the island, including at Port Rush, in Yall in County Cork, and Clifton in County Galway reflecting a certain path dependency which may or may not liberate alternative thinking and approaches. In some locations, there was an argument that such approaches, whilst successful in terms of enhancing the physical appearance and thus the attractiveness of place, did not address underlying causes of decline and tensions between local community members and tourists soon emerge. It was also highlighted by participants that whilst the coastal setting and scenery is advantageous in terms of promoting tourism development, attracting visitors as well as new residents, it can also hinder initiatives by masking levels of decline. And that was also um, uh, something that was identified as an issue in England. And one of the key reasons given for why, why the, the decline of, of resorts, English coastal resorts, wasn't identified in a more timely and efficient manner. Again, this emphasises the need to understand the Pacific coastal context and the challenges that they face. And there were repeated calls from around the island for increased policy attention of the particular needs and concerns of those living on the shoreline. The need to enhance local identity and avoid the standardisation of resorts was a particular concern for traditional um, tourism uh, resorts, such as Port Rush. Indeed, there was a general consensus that the distinctive attributes of each resort needed to be capitalised upon to enhance the unique identity and credibility of these places. The island-wide awakening to the resource potential of coastal and marine environments is perhaps most evident in traditional fishing communities, like uh, Kill Killybegs and County Donegal and Kilkeel where existing maritime skills are regarded as a considerable asset to diversifying into new areas of growth. Whilst there is some evidence then of a turn towards more innovative approaches, an integrated approach and institutional support and investment to sustain such actions and turn these visions into pro projects on the ground is currently lacking. And these places felt particularly isolated, not just in, in, in any sort of physical or locational terms, but also politically they felt quite on the edge. There was a general sense of being left behind. 
In terms of the identified components of community resilience, different communities stress the importance of some attributes over others. For example, in Yale, in County Cork, emphasized um, the need to develop learning skills and knowledge because the, the contemporary approach to regeneration there marked a deviation from traditional approaches that had been used in the past. So there's a need to educate the community on the benefits of that new approach. For many, however, the focus was placed on economic development and diversification in response to the particular challenges that these striving uh, resorts face. People placed relationships and sense of community were found to be critical in terms of fostering resilience um, and fostering uh, responses to local regeneration, which is hardly surprising. There's lots of evidence to support that elsewhere. But what was emphasised was the importance of the process of regeneration, the delivery of the initiatives. And I quite like this quote from a participant in Kinsale, who said, what's as important as getting that work done is the kind of synergies it creates. It, it builds communities, it creates community resilience. And this outlook, this perspective stresses that resilience cannot be built or delivered at the end of a project as an output, but rather it is something that is fostered throughout the duration of initiatives as a potential outcome. It was also clear that the prevalence of specific coastal hazards added an additional layer of complexity in terms of devising appropriate responses and interventions. But in many cases, coastal hazards were not acknowledged with, within regeneration plans even when these plans included significant shoreline infrastructure such as promenades and piers. And this apparent oversight may be attributed to a potential lack of awareness or appreciation of that interlinked nature between social systems and ecological systems, or a lack of capacity, either real or perceived, to deal with such dynamic processes. There is a clear need to enhance learning and knowledge in relation to these aspects of physical change to ensure that we are pla best placed to adapt to them, to plan for them, and move from being reactive to being more proactive. And an appropriate planning response in terms of locating and designing infrastructural developments or improvements is really important here. The natural assets and resources of the resorts significantly contributed to the initial growth and development of these places, but also to their contemporary regeneration approaches. So this may involve, for example, developing and celebrating heritage, as in Port of Ferry or Yall, or using marine and natural resources to facilitate new opportunities for energy generation and economic growth, as in Killy Bays and Kilkeel. So there's a need to balance then economic growth with the continued protection of the natural environment and resources, which ultimately underpin that growth. <clears throat> it was found that the negative economic influences associated with living on the edge have also fostered a considerable degree of entrepreneurialism. There are some communities, particularly in the west of Ireland, that are doing some amazing things with seaweed. Um, but issues relating to location, seasonality and changing demographics present key barriers um, to supporting that entrepreneurial activity in the long term. <coughs> Competing perspectives coupled with a lack of joined up thinking between different interests was identified in all cases. Accordingly, the provision of platforms for increasing interaction, cooperation and mutual learning between different stakeholders at different governance levels was highlighted as important. Across the cases, local resistance to change and apathy were identified as the most significant barriers to regeneration efforts. There is a need to stimulate interest and understanding, build local resources, improve local relationships and synergies to enable more innovative um, responses to social, economic and environmental decline. All cases examined emphasise the need for strong influential drivers or leaders who can coordinate and combine the cumulative impact of regeneration projects. These drivers may vary in their role in remit from a particularly concerned community member or community group to the local authority and so on. But that was held to be in the, up, the utmost importance for regeneration um, efforts in these places. So that was just kind of a, to give you a flavour of the key issues or concerns arising from these coastal places around the island. What I want to do now is, is kind of bring some of that together and present a number of action points um, that I think are, are required in order to enhance the future resilience of these coastal communities. The first point is really that social economic deprivation exists outside large urban areas and inner city neighbourhoods that have traditionally been the focus of regeneration policy and research. Traditional responses to decline may not be transferable 
to the distinctive context and conditions of coastal resorts. More bespoke interventions are required, which respect existing cultures and traditions and foster a positive place, image and identity. There is evidence of coastal de degeneration and we cannot afford to be complacent about it. Secondly, the diversity of coastal resorts presents a particular challenge to devising a coastal Pacific response and highlights the inadequacies of a one-size-fits-all approach. The typology of small coastal settlements that I shared with you earlier helps isolate and reflect Pacific coastal characteristics, providing for a more informed and consistent approach to intervention and policy development. Third, and notwithstanding the identified differences in the search for novel solutions, there is considerable potential for lasting drawn across the island of Ireland. But despite this, there is limited communication between coastal locales. A coastal network in that regard may help facilitate this lesson drawing and innovative thinking by providing a platform for knowledge exchange, co-learning and collaboration at a national and bi-jurisdictional level. Fourth, regeneration approaches which fail to acknowledge a place's resilience to change will fail to set that place on a more sustainable trajectory. When applied critically, the concept of resilience can capture interactions between natural and social, ecological, social economic systems, therefore providing a robust lens through which to view coastal resort regeneration and practice. This perspective illuminates a new role and responsibility for coastal regeneration policy and practice in terms of reconciling competing interests and values at the coast and the sustainable and equitable use of social, economic and environmental resources. In terms of coastal management, access and power, rights and responsibilities at the coastal interface remain elusive. The terrestrial planning system and the marine planning and licensing system are legally and functionally separate, but overlap in the intertidal area. It follows that district, local district councils need to work closely with the department and neighbouring councils and other relevant bodies to ensure that local development plans and marine plans are complementary. An integrated planning ethos is advocated to replace a tendency towards a sector approach. A more informed and integrated response to the regulation and management of planned development that is sensitive to the specific socioeconomic and environmental context of the coast is required. Reiterating the, the value of resilience thinking and stressing that there is no single strategy but a strategic response required to securing more resilient outcomes for our coastal communities. Thank you very much.